Normally, when we cross to a compound, you see maybe one AK or two AKs. These guys had RPGs, machine guns, they had AKs. Well, 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 what do we have here? A landmine. If I'm fed a healthy meal, I'm going to perform to the best of my ability. Son Smith, come here. Do I threaten you? I'll be a bitch in the kitchen. So many people have died defending what we all believe in. These guys and girls are out there still doing it. Get those guys over here, because it sounds like he's here. bleeding to them. Yes. I pray for you, Sergeant Gene Vance, that your family would take comfort in knowing that you were trying to protect your country. there is a typical day. Uh, the days pretty much start about 2400 uh, Zulu time and uh, run, you can easily run a 20 hour day and not even notice it go by. There's so much going on right now. Okay, we're gonna go ahead and head up the valley and we're gonna look for some arms uh, cache sites. So uh, short distance, but an all day affair. Roads are very narrow. I'm worried that if it is, in fact, a, a, a heavily supportive town, that there are Al Qaeda operatives that are going to take this opportunity to ambush us. So you know, we're on our highest level of uh, alertness. Normally, when we pull up to a compound, you see maybe one AK or two AKs. These guys had RPGs. They had uh, machine guns. They had AKs. It was pretty tense. There was only three Americans on site. We're out in the middle of nowhere, and the only link to the outside world is our radios. If it was a conventional force-on-force -force war, where you can identify the enemy easily, we probably wouldn't be here. Our role would be, you know, reconnaissance. <laughs> Okay, let's let's go inside and, and have a sit down. Our role is partially as politicians uh, as well as soldiers. You've got to uh, sit down with these guys, figure out what they need, what will help them, and in return, what will help you. I have reports of to the west of here, uh, still Al Qaeda, mm -hmm. yeah. we have to remove them. Yeah. Number one priority. Yes. I start and end almost every meeting with is uh, we're looking for the bad guys, we're looking for the Al Qaeda. Tell them. Yeah. They were reduced to the way the Russians would, would go to the towns and pull out the leadership, and uh, some of the guys never came home. Their bodies were never returned. So they start off with a lie to, to kind of feel you out. He says that we feel confidence that there is no Al Qaeda here. I know for a fact yeah. that in the mountains still, yeah. not here in town, yeah. but in the mountains still, yeah. there are still some Al Qaeda. Yeah. You can't always kick the doors in. I mean, there's a time for that kind of stuff, but there's also a time to talk your way in and uh, win them over. I know they're interested in uh, fixing their town. But there's, there is uh, a good reward for any Chechenian, yes. Arab, Pakistan. foreign, yes. Pakistani, yes. foreign yes, fighters that yes. are still here. If I certify them as Al Qaeda, yes, up to up to $5,000 yeah. for a single man, a single fighter. Mark and Mike went inside 
they had a, had, a, had a discussion, and then Mike came out to relieve me so I could actually go and have a look around. Because sometimes, you know, he may see some things, Mark might see some things, but then you get a third person in there, and there's a different situation. You know, you may look to your left and see a, a large caliber machine gun that they might have missed, or you might see a blanket that's covering something up. So it's always good to get as many eyes on inside the compound to see what's going on. Let me, let me change subjects. We have to get all the big weapons, yeah. the mortars, yeah. the big machine guns, yeah. out of the valley. Yeah. Now, the small weapons, the Kalashnikov, that's yeah. fine. That's for personal protection. Yeah. No problem. Yeah. He says, weapons, if you if you have any idea that there is yes, weapons, have idea. yes, sir, we will cooperate with you. Okay, well, I know they're here. Yes, sir. I know. You see, I've seen them. Yes, sir. You know, you know what planes, how yes, planes sir. take pictures. Yes, sir. I've seen the weapons. Yes, sir. I know where they are. Yes, sir. But if I have to dig them up, yes, sir. It'll be a problem. And pretty much it's just it's just all lies, you know, how much they love America and how much they want to kill Al Qaeda. So at the end of it, Mark says to him, Oh, by the way, I have one more question for you. Um, can we see what's behind those doors? Well instantly they stop talking, they look at each other and then a and then a, uh, a, a smile goes across their faces. Because they knew there was a uh, twin Zuki behind those doors. We opened the doors and there it is sitting right there, this uh, big heavy caliber machine gun, you know, that they'd been trying to hide from us all day. There's no machine guns up here. Well, there was one 100 feet from us the whole time, so it's par for the course. They lie. There's nothing you can do about it. You have to learn to work around it. So what's the plan? You know, they're gonna act surprised, this and that. Hell, they may have moved the thing. You never know. Or sold it. Or they may say, what gun? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Are you sure you were really here? Was that you? <laughs> Didn't take us too long to get up here. No, it's pretty good ride. Uh, let's go see, is the Zukiak still home? How are you? Hello, Good? Mike, yep. Hello. Hello. Wow. Alaikum. Touchdown. Hey, how you doing? Hello. Salam. Yeah. How are you? Good? Okay. Yeah? Good. Let me see, take a look here. Not of anything else. Well, it's still here, but you know, as you see, there's not anything else. No. They said, well, yes, we'll gather, we'll yeah, gather all, eight, so we'll gather all the weapons. It's yes, still. it's loaded. Perfect. Yeah, that's right. Last time we came down here, we asked them to get, uh, if they would bring all the heavy weapons here, the mortars, the machine guns, all that. And can you ask them there's nothing here? I know. That's the only thing in the whole valley. Yes, they saying accept the weapons that they have for themselves. Okay. All right. I knew that would be the answer. That, that's cool. I kind of liken it to that Saturday Night Live skit where every where, where the the uh, character lies all the time and just embellishes a lie, and the next lie is bigger and better. And oh, I got a whole community of guys up there like that. I'll tell you what we'll do. Uh, let's go outside and talk a little bit. I'll give you a chance to clear clear the gun out and start breaking it down and put it on the Kamas, okay? Okay, sir. All right. Let's go outside. Tell him that recently, over the last couple of weeks, all the American houses and camps have been uh, under rocket attack at night. While these rocket attacks are taking place, it scares away the people that want to come here and help. You know, the, the UN people, the private organizations will not come here as long as we're under attack. Yeah. 
Ευχαριστώ πολύ. Ευχαριστώ πολύ. Ευχαριστώ We got here, it was locked and loaded. One small step towards trying to demilitarize the entire country. Tell them I'm under orders yes, from the Karzai government, the federal government of Afghanistan, yes, sir. to confiscate all large weapon systems. Yes, sir. Now, if someone attacks them here, yes, sir. all they have to do is come to town, yes, sir. To, to Oregon, and get me, and I'll come up here and stop it. I get to play the, uh, the good guy, and I kind of smooth with them a little bit, talk to them, find out what they need, and uh, I let Drew be the bad guy. Where's the RPG-7? I asked, but okay. he said, shall Commander, shall I take to Sharana now? OK. So I, do I, I t I'll take the truck. Yeah. And when he brings the guns, we'll give him the truck back. OK? It's a bit of a bluff. I don't really want the truck, but I want the guns. Hey, where's the key to the truck? I played the bad guy. I'm going to take your truck. I'm going to take your generator. And then Mike was the mediator. said, no, nah, you know, we're your friends. And uh, we're going to let you keep your truck. So it's, it's kind of like playing the, big, uh, the good cop, bad cop. Let's hopefully get something. Tell them I know it's hard to do, but they're going to have to trust somebody sometime. And they might as well start now. The sooner they start working together, the better everything's going to get for everyone. I'll try to keep things settled down. In the meantime, I'm in there having tea with them. All the while, Drew is searching the building in the area. Drew's got a nose for firearms like nobody I know. He, uh, for a medic, he sure does have a proclivity for firearms. All the doors are locked, so we asked him, hey, you know, can we open the doors? Well, we've lost the keys. No problem. <laughs> we can break those locks. OK, hey, what I'll do is, I'll give, if there's nothing in there, I'll give him some rupees for the lock. I'll give him some money, OK? Nothing? One egg free inside. Come in, Scott, no problem. Drew! Drew! Come here. Oh! Well, 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 what do we have here? I hear a, well, 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 what do we have here? And I knew they'd hit the jackpot. And Drew's like a kid opening Christmas presents. And he just starts ranting and raving. Uh, you know, we have no firearms, we have no weapons, and what is all this? And I go in there with my tack light, and the room is absolutely full from floor to ceiling, from wall to wall, with every kind of anti-personnel, anything you could think of, from mines to weapons. Just incredible stuff. The largest small arms cache we've found to date. Uh, explosive charge in here, fuse well, all plastic. Extremely hard to detect, extremely sensitive. He's a nobody's friend. I believe that uh, Al Qaeda operatives pass through there, pick up weapons, ammunition, whatever they need, explosives, mines, whatnot, go do their operation, come back, drop them off, and they're back to being an unarmed member of the population. There's no other use for them except for against us. So this guy's just lied through their teeth. Every word that came out of the mouth is a lie. And I think Mark's kind of upset. I'm, I'm already pissed. So uh, we're taking everything. OK. That's good to have. There's another barrel for the, uh, the twin Zukia. So there's probably one more in there. There's spare barrels for it. And tires and everything. Egyptian um, claim on mine. Devastating. Come on, pick it up. Well, let's get all the big stuff out first. The machine guns go. Machine guns go. The machine guns are not home defense. Now, that's that, I can understand somebody needing a rifle here, but yeah. not a machine gun, not an RPG, and uh, not any mines or uh, explosives. We've got a rough ride back. Hasn't blown up yet, and hopefully we'll be okay. Let's go, let's go, line up, line up.
Come on. Just us left out here now. And you know, they're smiling and they're, they're uh, seem to be happy about it. I think deep down they really didn't want the guns here, but I think the elders wanted to keep them. Um, I didn't see anyone getting upset at all, of the locals at all. Hold up. All right, ready to roll? Oh, man. Let's go. Everybody on the back? Yeah. The hell is Hey, man, what a great day. Yeah, it's a good day. What do you mean it's a good day? It's a great day. <laughs> Uh, you know, it's, it's not just it's not just a great day because it's like, oh look what we got. It's like, well, 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 what do we have here? Yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah, when I when I heard that, I said he found it. <laughs> he found it. Ensure that everything is getting done properly by the books and the soldiers are happy. I feed everybody in this camp. All this gotta be cleaned up now. Y'all watch these fruits. She runs this. Nobody can tell her nothing. That's what I like about her. Next time I speak to your black ass, you better speak to me. Yes, yeah, Sergeant. All right then. Yeah, her ass is black. <laughs> some days she'll come in here in a good mood, and then some days she'll come in here with a bad mood. So you had to be flexible, because you know it's like, hey, if she's in a bad mood, everybody's going to be in a bad mood. But if she's in a good mood, we know we're going to have a good day. You better not burn my damn eggs. You burn them eggs, you know you're going to come in tomorrow morning and do eggs for the other shit. Right. A lot of people, you know, are scared of her. <laughs> but, I mean... <laughs> I just think no matter. I ain't gonna lie, I am. I stay away from You know what? From. What you say? You, what the hell you just said? I threaten you. Do I threaten you? Do I threaten you? Son Smith, come here. Do I threaten you? Never. John. Oh, yeah, I scare people. My voice is called the intimidator. Come here, Saw Cozy. How many services of steaks you got? I can't hear you. Okay. Don't look at me like you're gonna whoop my ass, cause you can't. Nah, Jones is she's uh she's great to work for. She's hard, but she's fair. You know what I mean? She's the same way with everybody, no favorites, nothing like that. That's the way she's supposed to be. If she don't be hard, you know, everybody get lax, you know what I mean? How long you been at work? And you on the phone already? I'm gonna go, Saw. I gotta go, Sean Jones. All right, love you, baby. My daughter got an F for science. She got an F? Can't do from over here. About time to tell It's only two things. Either you hate me or you love me. And uh, so far, I think uh, they love me. <laughs> you like working here? No. You ready to go home? Mm, yeah. You just got here. How you going to be ready to go home? Sorry, I'm ready to go. You said be honest, I'm being honest. I'm ready to go. <laughs> I've been here longer than you. I know. You should be ready I to go. I don't want to go because I don't want to leave the soldiers when I'm ready to go to be with my sons. My strength comes from my three sons. As long as I think about them, and it's my other son, that makes me much more stronger, even more stronger, knowing that I'm going to go home and see them. You got kids? I no, ain't sure. 
Right. What you waiting on? I don't know. I'm waiting on the right man to come along. Can't be having no babies by anybody. When a man coming? You got, look, I'm lying to men out there. Sign, I don't flow like that. I don't know nothing of them people. All you got to do is pick. You got to <laughs> check them out. Things are looking real good, and I'm damn shocked. I guess them soldiers don't want to work all day. Because they'll be here from sun up to sundown with me. I guess I'll go serve. This kitchen looks immaculately awesome. Oh, we got eggs, scrambled eggs, steak, bacon, hash brown, and oatmeal. We got lots of plates. Come on this side. You don't need no plate. You got steak or bacon. Keep lying going. Put steak and bacon on each plate, not both. These soldiers work so damn hard, it's pathetic, and they don't get no thank yous, no morale boosts. Yeah, I keep lying going. This line moves faster when I'm on. But we're doing a good job. These soldiers enjoy what they're getting right now. You got steak on them. You want bacon on If I'm fed a healthy, hot meal, Prior to going out to the mountains to try to find the Taliban or Al Qaeda group, I'm gonna perform to the best of my ability. Uh, the morning went pretty smooth. Um, everything was done according to my regulations. I try to keep everybody happy out here. If I make them happy, I'm happy. If they're not happy, I'm not happy. To be truthfully honest, I'll be a bitch in the kitchen. Well, we're driving to the flight line now. Pick up uh, two casualties that we know of that are coming in on the first helicopter. We're getting more casualties than we expected to. My name is Lieutenant Colonel Brian Eastridge. I am a trauma surgeon at Parkland Memorial Hospital in Dallas, Texas. This is the 947th Forward Surgical Team, and we're preparing to admit casualties this evening. Good. The role we have here is actually very similar to the role you see on the television show MASH. When you see the patient come off the helicopter, there's a huge adrenaline rush. Everybody wants to get them into the hospital as quickly as possible so you can get them in the light and actually evaluate what the patient's problem is. Our facility is the closest in which soldiers can receive surgical care. Uh, this gentleman came in. He was uh, one of the Afghan uh, militia forces, and he had uh, taken a bullet uh, through his right leg. We had an interpreter, so we were able to let him know what we were planning to do. The trajectory of the bullet goes right through where his popliteal artery and popliteal vein are. Without that vein in place, the blood flow would eventually cease to the leg and the leg could die. So he could lose his leg without repairing that. So we're taking some vein from the left leg, and we're gonna fashion that to fit the hole that's in the vein on the right leg. Yeah, that's the only Matt Conway's across the table from me. He's another general surgeon. He works in Vermont, and luckily he does a fair amount of elective vascular surgery at home. So this is this injury is actually right up his alleyway. Do me a favor, give me one of those little uh, army navies. Again, that's probably gonna happen down the road. All right, what happened to you, my friend? A cookery knife across three fingers. A what? Finger. A cookery knife. Okay. The ones that curved up. I can't feel my middle finger. How much pain you have? I have a lot of pain. Yeah. Our patient has uh, a large laceration to the palm of his hand. Uh, this laceration extends down to the bone on a couple of fingers. It's uh, transected some of the tendons that uh, allow the fingers to flex. I don't know if it was a bad guy or, or an accident. It sure looks like a bad guy came at him with a knife. Yeah. LT, do we know anything about the second bird? I'm gonna go back up to the flight line. Can you just sure. keep an ear out for me? Got 
two eight positive guys here. Yeah, come on, you guys. Need more. Call back to the aid station. I got okay. zero eight. We got two more standing by, and he's got five more. Okay, get those guys over here because it sounds like One, he's here. bleeding today. Yes. One of the soldiers that we were expecting died. And this is really disheartening for all the doctors and the medics and the nurses here, because uh, we were really looking forward to, to, to trying to save this guy's life. And so there's some pretty, uh, pretty disheartening people here right now. The injury that he had was a lethal injury. It's difficult to see American soldiers injured. It's obviously much more difficult to lose one. The people that we can help, we help, and the people that are beyond help are you know, one, of the, one of the bad parts about war. We got hit pretty hard tonight, and I'm sure this is going to take an emotional toll on some of these guys that are trying their hardest to keep these soldiers alive. I'm Ricardo Padron, Sergeant. I'm with the 3rd Battalion, 187 Infantry. That's the 101st Airborne. I'm originally from New York City. Back home, I was an uh, EMT with the New York City Fire Department. I took military leave so I can come back into the military. With the fire department, a lot of fire, a lot of brothers died. Whether I knew them or not, it doesn't matter. It's still brothers, they died. I'm an infantry soldier. I get paid to protect my country and its interest. And they did just that. They violated both sides. And to be blunt, I came back for a little payback. I came here with a certain group of soldiers that I helped train. And I'm separating from them, and they're going to carry on to further missions without me. I don't want to leave here. But unfortunately, I'm done. Uh, this war is still going to carry on without me. That's what's killing me right now. I don't, I don't want to leave this war. from the front line. We'll continue in a moment here on ABC. Are you you're the patient? Come on in, patient. We're going to have you sit right here. Uh, okay. So what's your name? Ricardo. Ricardo? Well, my name's Sergeant Bags. Most people call me Mel or Petey. Let us know if you need anything in flight. Wave your hand. You're good one. Okay. <laughs> Not that one. I'm originally from Augusta, Georgia lived there until I was 26. I decided to join the Air Force to get out of my hometown and to see if I liked medicine. I'd considered going to medical school, but I didn't want to do it until I'd done a little bit in the medical field to decide if I liked it. And I liked it so much, I'm still here. We're not so much a hospital, I would say, as a flying ambulance. Did that letter struck. We have about 1,500 to 2,000 pounds worth of equipment that we carry. It's, and the weight loss plan for women over 30. <laughs> Hump your bags every other day. <laughs> Extreme heat and no food. All the way down, watch the rollers. All the way down, all the way down, all the way down. All the way down, all the way down, stop. I think my husband was a little jealous because he's a retired operations officer and he didn't get to go with me or go do it on his own, so. <laughs> Wife goes off to war, husband stays home. A little different than it used to be. Right on his command, right there. We're going right here, okay? His command, we're going right there. You take that one. We way. had a post appendectomy. He was operated on at the FST, the forward surgical team. Now, take this stick, hold it up for me. Once we get the patient, we may take them to a field hospital, which can be anywhere out of the theater, depending on their injuries. It's stuck. Just stabilize the patient, keep them comfortable, and hopefully keep them out of the woods till we can get them where they need to be for more definitive care. Thank you very much. I'm your patient care tech, OK? I'm going to be taking care of you. I'm, I'm your good flight medic. He's not in a whole lot of pain. He's still taking some pain medication, so he's a little bit in la-la land. How's that? All right. Are you almost ready for us to turn the mic off? Hang on just a minute. Are you ready? Oh. 
We'll be ready in just a minute. This needs to be tied down. There you go, hon. You need some help putting them in? Well, we loaded the patients. We got everybody sitting down. We got the packs on board. We got all the bags loaded. Now to get everything back in here, get everybody in their seats, and everything tied down before we take off. OK. Doing my job, and I love it. 3409er. Start for take off. Alright, take off now, too. I've been drinking water. Okay, I'll get you some water. You feeling a little thirsty? I'll try to uh, buff up your little pseudo pillow there, okay? <laughs> okay, what's your name? Jeff. Jeff, okay. I remember that. That was my high school boyfriend's name. The people you fly with makes a huge difference. That really gets us through it. You leave your family and you come up here and you meet people that you've never even known, but it doesn't matter. Five minutes feels like you've known them all your life. And the friendships that come out of things like this are forever enduring. Five, seven, enter, check wheels down, wind, runway three, west side, 90 feet to green line. Here we go. We brought the patients in. The uh, recovery crews will come out and pick up the patient. They'll take over patient care from here. We'll offload them. Nick. We'll offload Ricardo. Bye, big guy. Write me and let me know, Ty, how you're doing now. He's got some long time healing and a lot of therapy he's going to need for that hand. So many people have died defending what we all believe in. And these guys and girls are out there still doing it. So for me, they're my heroes. Last night, there was a lot of operations going on about 30 clicks away from us. And my crew was up for the next patient. We were doing our usual things that we do to pass the time, checking our email, playing cards, harassing each other. And my uh, medical crew director came into the tent and said that he had been over at the FST, which is where the Ford surgical team is, and that a call came in and they were rushing around for units of blood and that one of the special forces guys had been injured, critically injured. And that he wanted me to go and check the equipment again and get our stuff together. So we waited and we waited and we waited. And kept waiting for, the, for them to call us on the radio to tell us to come back, that we were going to jump on an airplane to take our patient out. And the call never came. And when we got back to our side of camp, we found out that he didn't make it. I thought at first that I knew, maybe might know who he was. We live with a lot of the Special Forces guy, guys in and around the theater. I cut their hair and, you know, we go to town with them. And I found out that it wasn't one of the guys that I knew personally, but it didn't make it any less tragic. You know, he was going to be my patient. And then he wasn't. And the next morning when we got up, and. I get up to go brush my teeth and wash my face, do my usual morning thing. And when I looked out, the flag was flying at half mast. And that was pretty hard. And you know, I didn't even know this guy. But he was one of us. He was one of us.
the last time I saw him was actually on Valentine's, Valentine's Day weekend. We had a wonderful long weekend together that I consider to be a complete godsend. From what I've been told is every night he, he had a picture, our picture sitting by the bed, and every night he said goodnight to it, and he said, I love Lisa, and all he talked about was how much our relationship meant to him. Chaplain Captain Terry Jarvis, and uh, I'm en route to uh, Ramstein Air Base uh, for our fallen soldier detail. It's good for the troops to see that the dead is honored and that the dead is taken care of and not just put into the ground. It's, it's important to see that all the special care is taken just to get one soldier back. I pray for you, Sergeant Gene Vance, that God would go with you, that you would know his peace, that your family would take comfort in knowing that you were trying to protect your country. shepherd I shall not be in want he makes me to lie I don't believe that people back home possibly understand the great sacrifice that is made a young soldier th that's fallen who woke up that morning who didn't know he thought it was just gonna be a normal patrol that day even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death I will fear no evil. My name is June. I'm, I'm the mother of, of Sergeant Gene A. Vance, nickname Buddy that we've always called him, uh, which we got from his father. He was stationed in Afghanistan and he was killed this year. We were planning for the honeymoon, we were planning to have a baby, we were planning to buy a bigger house, and he was gonna go back to school and finish his degree. And that's, that's what we talked about. It was all wonderful, happy things, and it was a whole future. My son, I think he was a hero and a very kind gentleman. A child is a part of you. That bond is always there. I knew that he wasn't coming back. I keep telling everybody, I feel like I have no plans for my future now. Everything I, everything I planned, everything we had planned is defunct. I, 
I obviously don't need to buy a bigger house, and I'm not having a baby, and I'm not going on a honeymoon. There's a reason why we're there, and we're there for our freedom. We're there so that I can sit here in this house and not have to worry about getting killed when I go to my office. Yeah, there's, there's a reason, and what they're doing is right. It's just terrible that it has to take the life of such a wonderful person.